from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. As customers try to get AI right, the need to rationalize siloed data becomes increasingly important. Data practitioners can put all their data eggs into a single platform basket, but that's proving impractical. As such, firms are moving to an open model where they maintain control of their data and can bring any compute engine to any of their data, while compelling the capabilities to govern open data across an entire state remain immature. Regardless, the move toward open table formats is gaining traction and the point of control in the data platforms wars is shifting from the database to the governance catalog. Moreover, as data platforms evolve, we see them increasingly as tools for analytic systems to take action and drive business outcomes. Now, because catalogs are becoming freely available and open source, the value in data platforms is also shifting toward tool chains to enable a new breed of intelligent applications that leverage the governance catalog to combine all types of data and analytics while preserving open access. Two firms, Snowflake and Databricks, are at the forefront of these trends and are locked in a battle for mindshare that is both technical and philosophical. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I take a look back at what we learned from this year's back-to-back -back customer events from the two leading innovators in the data platform space, and we'll share some ETR data that shows how each firm is faring in the other's turf and how a new application paradigm is emerging that ties together data management, open governance, and of course, AI leadership. Let's start by looking at how the landscape of data platforms is shifting right out from under our feet. We really see five areas that underpin a platform shift where systems of models will, we believe, come together to become the next architecture for intelligent apps. Now, as we said up front, the point of control uh, began to shift last year as Databricks announced its U Unity catalog and continued this year as Snowflake open sourced its Polaris metadata catalog and then Databricks responded by open sourcing Unity a week later. Oh, and by the way, acquiring Tabular the week before. George, let's take these one at a time. Please explain your point of view on this dynamic and what we learned this past month. So, as you, as you said, or in, as you alluded to, the, the center of gravity began to shift last year. Really, the Earth started shifting on its axis a little bit when at the Data and AI Summit, Matei Zaharia, the creator of Spark and the co-founder of Databricks, um, introduced the Unity Catalog. Because at that point, what he was basically signaling was the point of control over the system of truths about your data estate was shifting from the DBMS to the catalog. The DBMS used to have read-write control of the data. Now the catalog was going to have or mediate read-write control over the data. Now, this doesn't mean there's no DBMS involved. There's actually a DBMS-like execution engine attached to the catalog that has to mediate those reads and writes but that actually can be a new embedded low overhead and low priced SKU. So that's the crucial distinction in terms of who owns that point of control. Okay, thank you. So let's come back to the, to the list and, and talk about, let's take two, three, and four here together. We're, we're envisioning an application shift where data platforms really inform business actions and value is shifting as well, as we said, and it's going to continue to shift towards tools and workflows that build on and leverage the governance catalog that is becoming more important and more open. We've cited both Mosaic AI, an offering that comes out of Databricks acquisition of Mosaic ML, they've rebranded now, uh, that, that was last year right at their uh, summit, and Cortex, which is Snowflake's ML and AI managed service. George, we're talking here about blending all types of analytics in this system of systems, if you will. Can you please explain your thinking here? So to date, data platforms have mostly been about building standalone analytic artifacts, uh, what some people call data products, whether it's uh, um, dashboards, ML models, maybe even as simple as um, 
denormalized um, refined tables. And now um, we're getting to something slightly more sophisticated in the form of RAG grounded um, Gen AI models. When I say RAG grounded, this is where there's a, a retriever, there's vector embeddings, but these are simple request response type artifacts. What we're moving toward are systems that drive a business outcome, like nurturing a lead down a funnel or providing uh, expertise to a customer service agent as to how to guide um, uh, a more effective response uh, to a customer online or, or to forecast sales and then drive operational planning. These are more sophisticated workflows that include both a supervised human or a supervising human and an agent that's performing figuring out how to perform a set of tasks under the, that human supervision to drive some sort of outcome. All right, good. Now, coming back to the final point on this graphic, there's a, a potential wild card brewing further up the stack. We've discussed, for example, many times the Salesforce data cloud and its customer 360 approach where applications like Salesforce, they embed the business logic inside the application and Salesforce and others on this list that harmonize the business process data, which is a piece that both Snowflake and Databricks appear to be missing, or perhaps you know, the, we should say they're relying maybe on the ecosystem to deliver that. But George, explain why these companies are a threat or a wild card or what you've called a blind spot here. Because when you're building these analytic systems to drive business outcomes, they need the context of what is the state of the business, what happened in the business in order to determine what should happen next. And if you just have a data lake that has 10,000 or 100,000 tables or however many it is, you don't know what 500 tables have some parts of all the attributes that define what's the context with this particular customer. Um, and then beyond that, how that customer relates to a sales process or a service process. And that's what none of these vendors have yet. And when you ask them, uh, someone asked at um, the Databricks Analyst Day, uh, what's, they asked Ali, who's the CEO, you know, what's the role of a, of a graph database, which is the sort of technology that would harmonize all this context into meaningful business objects and the business relationships that connect them, the activities that connect them. And his response was, that's kind of a, a niche technology. Although when I asked Matei Zaharia um, a couple months before on the potential role for graph databases um, in Unity Catalog, he said, ultimately, yes, Unity would be a knowledge graph. And then the CTO of Mosaic said, yes, in the future, we will be training our Gen AI models to make sense out of the data based on how the knowledge graph stitches it together. So you know it's in their plans, but even if they built this knowledge graph that has the people, places, things in the business, it doesn't yet give them as rich a map of the state of the business that someone like a Salonis mines from all the application logs or that Microsoft is building with its AI ERP effort as part of the power platform in Dynamics. Um, Palantir has something like that. And um, Enterprise Web and um, Relational AI are both building uh, technologies that should make it easy to build, easier to build that sort of capability. So the point is the tool chains are there, but when we say they build on the catalog, that catalog itself has to grow in sophistication to make sense out of the business so that the tools know how to consume it. Got it. Okay, I'm going to be talking more about the catalog, but let's move along right uh, to the next sort of section. In the past, we've talked a lot about how Snowflake had the lead in database, probably like a five-year lead in database, and Databricks was having to play catch-up in that regard, but Databricks indicated at its data and AI summit that its Lakehouse offering was the fastest-growing product in the company's history, and I, and I believe the figure was on a, $400 million run rate. So let's take a look at some of the ETR data to see what it tells us. Here's a graphic from the April survey of more than 1,800 IT decision makers, ITDMs, 
net score or spending momentum is shown on the vertical axis. That's a measure of the net percent of customers in the survey that are spending more on a platform. Now, the horizontal axis is overlap or penetration, pervasiveness in those roughly 1,800 accounts. And that red line at 40% on the vertical axis represents to us a highly elevated spending momentum. And this is the database and data warehouse sector. And the key point we want to make is that Databricks first showed up in the survey back in January 2023 and is showing both spending velocity and impressive penetration in the data set. Note that its ends have increased from 146 in January 2023, and they were up to 292 in April. So it made both a major move to the right, and it held on to the vertical axis. And, and you can see, uh, Alex, you bring that slide back up. You can see that uh, Snowflake was up and to the left. This, this, we took this back for Snowflake back to January 2022 when it was net score was up in the 80% range. So it was in the stratosphere and, and pretty much unsustainable, but it, but it has come down. Of course, it's made moves to the right as well. But the point is that Databricks actually showing up um, more prominently than one might expect. Now let's flip the script and focus on the sector that has historically been the stronghold of Databricks in a sector where Snowflake was really not considered a player. That's the MLAI sector that we're showing here. Same dimensions, spending velocity or net score by, penet uh, uh, by penetration on the horizontal axis. So net score vertical, penetration on the horizontal or pervasiveness on the horizontal. Snowflake was just added to the sector in the survey that's in the field today. It's so it's you know, late June, it's the, the July survey, it'll close. So this is preliminary data, but you can see the early returns. And this is more than 1,500 accounts. It's showing Snowflake, while well, much lower than Databricks on the vertical axis, it is both above the 40% magic line and further to the right than Databricks, indicating a strong adoption of its new AI tooling. George, I know you have thoughts on both of these data points, so pick it up from there, please. I, I think that um, what's significant here is that Snowflake did a really good job with Cortex as embedding Gen AI capabilities so that it's a natural outgrowth of their two strongest personas or two of their strongest personas, data engineers and data analysts, so that they could use um, Gen AI capabilities, let's say from within stored procedures in the database with drop dead simplicity. So they up-leveled essentially the capabilities of their personas through what they do best, which is make it really simple to use new functionality. Now, Databricks is high on the net score or spending momentum likely because they did such a good job up-leveling the data scientists, data engineers, and ML engineers as extensions of their existing tool chains. That was what um, they did that, that surprised me, for instance, that I, I thought uh, Gen AI was going to be uh, an entirely new tool chain. So, for example, ML engineers became LLM ops engineers because ML Flow, which is Databricks standard for operational tracking of um, models, expanded to encompass tracking LLMs, and then Unity absorbed that tracking operational data so that, again, the existing personas were up-leveled to take advantage of the new technology. And since the uh, data scientists, data engineers, and ML engineers were sort of the natural center of gravity for Gen AI spending, that's what um, Databricks harnessed so effectively in the last year. Okay, so coming back to our premise here that the point of control is shifting to the catalog, not, not the point of value necessarily, although Snowflake obviously trying to hang on to that horizon value, but not the value necessarily as much as the function in this space is being, because it's being open sourced, catalog that is. Here's a chart that Databricks put up at its event last week showing all the different data platforms that Unity connects to, the different types of data and capabilities it offers and the open access. We can bring any of these process, processing engines to the data and have them all governed by Unity. That's basic plan. Now, Ali Goetze of Databricks, uh, the CEO, also talked about the customer needs. And he showed three very simple but effective and important points in his keynote last week, which are shown here. Ali 
talks to a lot of customers, as do all leading CEOs, and he points out that every C CIO, board member, CEO, leader, you name it, wants to get going on AI, but they're also leery of making mistakes and putting their companies in, in jeopardy from a legal and a privacy standpoint. So they need governed AI. And as we said up front, they also recognize that a fragmented data estate is a recipe for bad AI, high cost, low value, and basically failed projects. Now, the vision that Databricks put forth at its Data Plus AI Summit was very compelling. Goatsey said, don't give your data to a vendor, including Databricks. You should control your own data. He was basically saying, if you give it to the vendor, they're going to jack up prices, lock you in, et cetera. So a little, little fear-mongering there, but you know, we've, we've seen it in the past. But the vision is control your own data and be able to bring any engine to the data and apply the best engine for the job that you're trying to accomplish. Basically, may the best engine win. So this bet on an open is, is a, on open is very attractive to customers and it resonates with them. However, I will tell you, when we talk to customers, they tell us they love the vision. But when we talk about governance, the answer we typically get is, well, we're still trying to figure that out. Do they go with Unity? Do they go with Polaris, Horizon, something else? Many customers are still trying to determine this. So, And part of the reason is this world of governance is evolving very rapidly. Here's an example of a mic drop moment that Matei Zaharia laid on the audience this, uh, this, the, the week after Snowflake announced, he announced it was open sourcing Polaris. And then in real time, Zaharia in front of an audience of 16,000 attendees opened his Unity console up, his GitHub, he opened it up to the world. We have a clip of this moment. Alex, please run it. Just for real, when are you actually releasing it? Maybe in 90 days, maybe 89 days, because Ali announced it yesterday. Um, I'm just going to walk over to my laptop right here. <laughs> yeah, so this is, this is Unity Catalog on GitHub. You know, looks, looks solid to me. People are working hard on it. So just going to go into the settings here, scroll down to the danger zone. And make this thing public. Yep, I want to make it public. I understand. Make it public. All right, and I think it's public now. So yeah, take a look. So github.com Unity Catalog. Okay, so George, I ask you, was this a nail in the coffin of Polaris, uh, which is the metadata catalog, the, the, the technical metadata catalog that Snowflake open source the week before? Is Polaris DOA? Why or why not? This moment was sort of like one of those tennis um, championship matches where when the camera is focused on the audience, you watch the heads snapping back and forth. Like at Snowflake Summit, we thought, oh, assessing... Uh, Polaris would sever Unity's uh, connection with iceberg tables. Then, as you showed, the next week, everyone thought Databricks OSSing uh, Unity um, as a rich operational and business catalog would sever Polaris's hold over iceberg data. And then when the dust started to clear, it became clear that it wasn't so simple because uh, what happens is... And, and this wasn't as clear as it should have been coming out of Snowflake. Um, at least I didn't think it was. The Snowflake native horizon operational and business catalog that is part of the Snowflake data platform actually federates all the governance information with Polaris. So all your security and uh, privacy policies, all the governance policies are replicated and synchronized with the Polaris catalog so that you can have unified governance of your Snowflake data estate and your Iceberg data estate, where, to be clear, when the, when the data is in Snowflake, including managed Iceberg tables, third parties can read that Iceberg data. They can't write it. And now Polaris governs the external tables that anyone else can read and write and Snowflake can read, but those external tables now have unified governance. So if you're a Snowflake shop and you have iceberg tables, you have a comprehensive governance solution. Now, 
here's the, if you are a Delta shop and you're using Unity, um, any engine can read and write Delta tables. So that's an advantage for Databricks. Um, but third-party tools only have read access to iceberg tables. I don't think a lot of people realized um, that Unity uh, does not offer, um, is not able to mediate write access to iceberg tables yet. That's a problem, and that's why we think um, Tabular, uh, the creators of Iceberg, were part of such a bidding war and ultimately were snapped up by Databricks. Yeah, so that's the other big chess move here that we reported, just as Snowflake's co-founder, Benoit Dajaville, was stepping on the stage to present his keynote, Databricks dropped a press release. I mean, it was like literally timed perfectly that it was acquiring Tabular, which is the firm founded by Iceberg uh, creators. You may recall we had Ryan Blue, the CEO of Tabular, on previous breaking analysis. Uh, George has also featured Ryan on his program, and we've discussed all these different formats, including Delta tables, which is, again, the default format in Databricks and very widely adopted. Let's listen to Ryan Blue talk about the difficulty in translating between multiple formats. Please play the clip. And it's worth mentioning, Dave, just to emphasize, he made this comment before they were in acquisition play. So this is unvarnished PR. This is not, this is not PR. Okay, uh, play the clip. I don't know that I'm saying you need to commit to one. I am saying that translating between them is uh, probably not going to give you the the results that you want. So let's let's start with the first question. Um, so uh, iceberg has two things that uh, the other formats lack in some respect. Um, one is uh, a strong technical foundation. Um, like I said, we stole a whole lot of stuff from the database world. Um, so we fixed things like schema evolution. You should just be able to run rename column without either dropping or resurrecting data from, you know, from two years ago or anything like that, right? These things need to be reliable and have well-defined SQL behaviors. Um, there were so many uh, correctness problems. Um, we, we really tried to fix them all. Um, not all the formats did that. And so that is one thing that distinguishes Iceberg. Okay, so George, you know, there you have it. Uh, thank you for, uh, again, let's clarify, this was before the acquisition. So it, it was sort of, you know, competing for Mindshare at the time. Um, and this, this was, uh, again, uh, Ali Goetze, you know, bought uh, Ryan's company for what the Wall Street Journal reported was somewhere between one to two billion. So this is before he was tainted by those zeros. But now Databricks, as the brainiacs that created Iceberg, so they can make Databricks uh, uh, uniform. That's the capability to enable interoperability between Iceberg and Delta formats. The question is, can they, now that they have the creators of the standard, can they get this to work seamlessly? And will, George, will, will this end the standards war? Well, based on what we heard Ryan say, it's, it's not easy, but it just, it does change the dynamics. Because when I talked to Ryan, the problems he was working on really extended beyond making the table um, formats function to adding the, the governance capability. He, is, as far as I understood, was really working on a catalog with a, uh, a sophisticated policy engine for um, advanced governance. And it became pretty clear uh, you know, when he was on stage um, and in Ali's discussion of the objectives of the acquisition, that the goal now is redirecting all the brains of that 40-person team more towards interoperability. That's the implication, interoperability with Delta format than with adding a policy engine that's no longer necessary because that's going to be subsumed by uniform. And so the implication is that could be potentially um, a downside for Snowflake, which uh, rather than seeing um, Iceberg uh, evolve in the direction of adding the advanced functionality that's in the proprietary version of Iceberg tables that Snowflake has, now it's more moving in the direction of just uh, 
uh, delta interoperability. That's a potential scenario. Well, and a very attractive one, right? Because you don't, I mean, if they can get this to work and work you know, seamlessly at, at high performance with all the requisite you know, functionality along with it, that means you don't have to make copies and you've now, you know, you've tried to maintain that you know, single version of the truth. All right, let's turn our attention to AI. Last year, right before the Databricks Data and AI Summit, Databricks announced the acquisition of a company called Mosaic ML for around $1.3 billion, bringing more AI talent into the company. Databricks has leveraged this acquisition to offer Mosaic AI, a diagram of which is shown here. George, can you kindly explain the importance of the acquisition, uh, what you heard at the show around Mosaic AI, where that fits and the value that it brings? Okay, so I'm already um, on record and on video uh, offering to um, slice up my hat, add some condiments, and eat it for a bad prediction that I made 15 months ago, which was just setting context. I thought the Gen AI wave was something Microsoft would use to steamroll Databricks um, because it was going to be, in my assumption, a new tool chain and that Essentially, Microsoft gave up on Azure ML uh, three, four years ago, and I thought started building tools for this new wave. Um, now, Databricks did an astonishing job in, as I was saying earlier, up-leveling the personas they had with new capabilities, many of which came from the Mosaic acquisition. Now, what's key here is that, again, we're not building standalone artifacts and um you're building systems of models, each of which has specialized ta tasks. And then what's crucial about the tool chain is you're going to optimize how all those pieces work together. Now, that's not all there yet. And what wasn't actually formally announced yet, but sort of came out in discussions, is that they um, have hired uh, the, the researcher who created um, DSPy, which is really a successor to Langchain. Langchain became sort of uncool once everyone heard about DSPy, which is a way of essentially optimizing, optimizing a full pipeline of specialized models. This is not something we've seen from other vendors, including, frankly, Snowflake yet. And also crucially, the evaluation function um, in this tool chain is critical because when you're building self-improving or not self-improving, but continually improving models, the evaluation capability is the critical piece that gives the feedback to the models to continue learning. And so when you put all these pieces together, Mosaic, the Mosaic tool chain is well on its way towards helping customers build very sophisticated compound systems. And so this notion that you just have GPT-4 an embedding model, a vector database, and a retriever, you know, that's all gone. Um, now we're building much more sophisticated um, tool chains. And I think that that brings us to the next point, Dave, which is when you start aggregating these together, you get something more more sophisticated. Well, so let's project that out and try to visualize it, you know, thinking out a few years, and we'll talk about how we see this application paradigm evolving. Basically, what we've done here is we've taken that previous slide, the Mosaic AI pipeline, and created multiples of them to build essentially a system of systems where you know, different models are leveraged. You get foundation models, you're gonna have domain specific models and the like, and they feed you know, sort of a new model that can take action. So you know, coming back to this notion of the six data platform concept, or maybe beyond that, George, a digital representation of your business that reflects on the state of people, places, things, you know, our Uber for the enterprise, uh, where the system of analytics can inform the top level system, and that top-level system is agentic, meaning an intelligence system that's able to work autonomously, making decisions, adapting to changing conditions in real time, and taking action with or potentially even without human interaction based on the specific use case. So, George, I wonder if you could pick up on this concept and add some other key points that folks should be made aware of. Okay, so let me give you an example of what this might make possible um, sometime in the future with a, a frontier vendor. This is a spoken to Amazon, not AWS, but amazon.com, the head of forecasting, uh, Ping Zhu. They've taken 
um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give you an agent of agents example that's that's really leading edge. They took um, about 15 years of sales history so that they now have a forecast that can extend five years into the future down to the SKU level for 400 million SKUs, including products that they haven't seen yet. When they can forecast with reliable precision, then they have a whole bunch of planning agents that can be coordinated across um, or, or on account of that forecast. And those planning agents go from how should they build out their um, their fulfillment center capacity, how to configure it, down to uh, what they should order from each supplier, how to lay that out or distribute that across the distribution centers, the cross docking, all the way to what gets picked, packed, and shipped. The point of that is you have a system of agents that are trained together to figure out an optimal set of plans but that are coordinated, coordinated in service of some top level objective, let's say growth or profitability, and then local constraints for each of the agents. The point is that is a system of systems that serves to drive a business outcome and that needs very advanced tools that don't fully exist yet from merchant, you know, uh, uh, mainstream vendors, but someone like Amazon is showing the way for what's going to become possible. And that's where we see value being created in the future. Great. Thank you for that. All right, let's recap and end on what we see as the outlook and possible next moves for Snowflake, Databricks, and then some of those other players. And then, George, let me just go through these and then you know, please give us your final thoughts. So as we said, we're moving from the, this sort of DBMS-centric where the DBMS is managing the data to, uh, to tools using a catalog to build what we just showed you, this idea of systems of systems that feed this you know, Uber system, if you will. Uh, the table format resolution uh, <laughs> remains unresolved. It's an open issue. Uh, we're going to be watching very closely to see what happens with, with, with Databricks, with Tabular, uh, how successful they are uh, at integrating uh, I use the word seamlessly. I know it's an overused word. Uh, with Delta, the, to what extent Snowflake extends Horizon? Remember, Polaris is the technical metadata. That's open source. Horizon is all the role-based access controls and all the all the really value high-value governance. Um, uh, that, but you you basically got to be inside of Snow, uh, Snowflake to take full advantage of it. Um, you know, and or with managed uh, iceberg uh, tables, but that's, again, inside of Snowflake. Um, so where do they take Horizon? Are they going to go beyond Snowflake native data? I don't think they've decided yet. I think they're going to let the market decide. Um, if if the open source doesn't deliver, then customers might be enticed to, to, to stay inside or go inside, move more data inside of Snowflake. If open source moves fast, then we'll likely see Snowflake make some moves in, in that direction, further moves in that direction. You know, Databricks, next steps, they're gonna unify Delta. We just talked about that. Bring Delta and Iceberg, you know, together uh, more tightly. They've got now the the creators of Iceberg to help do that. So they really deeply understand how Iceberg works, you know, better than Databricks uh, uh, does or did. And so that's a, you know, Frank Slubin at one point said, to, to me, hey, a lot of times we do these acquisitions to pick up talent. And um, this is a good example. We certainly saw that with uh, Mosaic ML. Uh, and we saw that with, with Diva at, uh, at Snowflake. Uh, and so the idea with Databricks, as we see it, is to make Unity the catalog of catalogs, that Uber catalog that, that we talked about. And the wildcard does remain the players that are building out the semantic layer. Uh, we talked about that, uh, folks you know, like Salesforce with the data cloud, uh, like Palantir, we're doing some of these interesting things. Um, and of course, the big hyperscalers, George, we haven't talked about them. They're obviously in this mix. They, you know, collectively are approaching $200 billion, the top three U.S. hyperscalers. So, you know, we can't count them out either. Your final thoughts. Um, you know, we talked about the semantic layer, like a year ago, first we were talking about as business intelligence metrics, um, then we talked about the enabling technology to 
uh, make it possible to build a, sem a semantic layer with the declarative knowledge graphs from relational AI or enterprise web, but there are compromised versions today where essentially Salesforce is becoming a hyperscaler with a set of applications and a semantic layer. Um, and then um, I'm going to tease Dave a future episode that we do where we we become armchair quarterbacks for how the vendors might um, evolve and try and outmaneuver each other. One example with Snowflake is take it from being uh, a catalog that's embedded within the DBMS to uh, a SKU that stands standalone. It might be priced differently, even if it's got the same technology in it. It might be extended so that it uses perhaps something like Dagster to orchestrate the data engineering workflows that happen beyond the scope of Snowflake, because if it does that, it can capture all the lineage data, which is the foundation of all operational catalogs. And so that's one way Horizon could start extending its reach beyond just what's happening within the Snowflake DBMS. We'll tease that for, for a later show. But there's... There's a lot that's going on because what these vendors are jockeying for really is not just the next data platform, but it's the next application platform. It's the platform for intelligent applications. Big stakes, George. Thanks so much. Great work. Really appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to, 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 to the next episode that we, we do on this topic. It keeps evolving very quickly. All right. Thanks, Dave. All right. That's it for now. Thanks to Alex Meyerson. Uh, also, Ken Schiffman there on production. And Alex handles our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor-in-chief over at SiliconAngle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. We publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and SiliconAngle.com. And you can email me at david.vellante at SiliconAngle.com or DM me at dvellante if you want to pitch us or you got some good ideas. We get a lot of pitches. Don't be offended we don't respond or we don't we just keep keep coming keep the ideas coming um also feel free to comment on our linkedin posts and check out etr.ai they have the best survey data in the enterprise tech business this is dave Vellante for george gilbert for the qubit research insights powered by etr thanks for watching everybody and we'll see you next time on breaking analysis <laughs>